You know, the season of Lent and Easter is right around the corner. So watch for changes in the decor in the, both the sanctuary and the family life center. The liturgical color of purple marks the seasons of pent penitence and preparation of Lent. Ash Wednesday will be March the 2nd, the first day of Lent. And we will have a pancake dinner that night in, room, in the Family Life Center with a Mardi Gras theme uh, where the men will cook and serve the pancakes. And this will be followed by uh, the pastors conducting an imposition of the ashes ceremony. So we're going to get Fat Tuesday out of the way right before we go into Ash Wednesday. Uh, so round up your palm crosses from 2021, it's Palm Sunday, uh, and bring them to add to the fire because we need that, that ash to impose the ashes. The red pads are on the aisle seats. Uh, this is for attendance. If you would grab that and put your name and your best contact information, we would sure appreciate it. The Women's Bible Study uh, had planned a, a trip to the monastery over at Florence on Wednesday, but they're going to postpone that till Friday due to possible bad weather. So check your email for updates. We'll also be passing the offering baskets today, just like the good old days. So there are lots of other things going on in the life of the church. Uh, check our website for updates and your uh, Friday email blast will tell you a lot of things that are going on. After the service today, you can go down to the FLC, uh, use the restroom, and, and then have a cup of coffee with your friends. So uh, that fellowship time is, is a nice time. It's growing, and we're, we're happy to provide that. So now, as you're able, let's stand for our call to worship. Come and learn the ways of our God. Let God turn your hearts to His ways. We want our ways Let God turn your eyes from vanities.
close our hearts to God and disobey God's law, together let us confess our sin. We confess to you, O God, and before one another, that we have sinned. You have gifted us with your Spirit, the Spirit that dwelt in Jesus, and yet we have failed miserably in living out your love and power. When you call us to be loving and forgiving, instead of
reason why a lot of these hymns have become so important in our faith uh, was a result of black spirituals that were created uh, in the 1800s uh, when, as you know, black people were enslaved. And there's a bit of a history lesson, and Paul told me I could only do two minutes, so we're only going to get this much of it, in that when slaves were brought over from Africa, uh, you know, they weren't Christians, but many of them were converted to Christianity when they uh, got them. And so they formed a spiritual tradition of um, black and African rhythms and harmonies and melodies along with Christian ideas. In addition, some of the hymns, like the next one that we're going to do, Wade in the Water. What? You have water? Oh. <laughs>
uh, leads us into our prayer time together, and I have a prayer request. Uh, we need to pray for Don Arbaugh, who is recovering from surgery. Please join me in prayer. We worship and adore you, O God, for you have not only created us, but you have also made us to live joyfully and abundantly in this world and in the world to come. We thank you for the blessings you have bestowed on us. We thank you for the scriptures that show us your way. We give you thanks for the personal witness of those who follow your path as they have shared with us the good news about the path of life you have set before us. We thank you for those who have the courage to confront us when, we, when, when they see us taking the wrong road. We thank you for this day, this beautiful day that you have given to us to come together as your people to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray for you, we pray to you for one another in our need and for all anywhere who are on the road that leads to adversity and death. As you move among them and invite them to choose a better path, help us to share with those around us the joy of following Jesus. We ask that you intercede in all of the prayer requests spoken aloud this morning but also those that we keep in our hearts. All these things we pray through Christ, our only Savior, who has taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and we give us our debtors. Join us for our next hymn. 
building in the sanctuary here these last seven weeks, haven't we? It's about building our lives brick by brick, stone by stone, just like they did way back then. Nehemiah had finished the walls. Uh, Zerubbabel had rebuilt the temple. Ezra had even come and, and shared the law of God with them. Well, my job is now done here, says Nehemiah. I can go back, I can go back to being the, the head butler, the, 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 uh, the head butler, the, the chief of, of, um, of the palace back in Persia. That was a pretty good gig. I think I'll go back and do that some more. You know, when you get things just right, when you arrange things just the way you want it, it doesn't really stay like that very often, does it? Nehemiah, a couple of years later, went back and checked up on Jerusalem. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. Gentiles, not even Jews, Gentiles doing business in the courts of the temple. And the priests, and this is what gets me, the priests were not getting paid. <laughs> and neither were the musicians, by the way. They were all in the same boat. Worst of all, some guy named Tobiah had started to live in one of the rooms in the temple. This is not the YMCA. This is the temple. And in the room in which the taxes should have been collected for the priests and the musicians and the custodians, their living wages, the place they were supposed to store that, there was this guy just, just living there, doing his own little side business out of the temple, by the way. So Nehemiah says, I go away for five minutes and look what you do. This is not why we rebuilt Jerusalem. I shall read to you from Nehemiah, the 13th chapter, beginning at the 4th verse. This is the word of God. Now before this, Eliashib, the priest, had put, put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah, and he had provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain, offerings, and incense, and temple articles, and also the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, the musicians and gatekeepers as well, as the contributions for the priests. But while all this was going on, I, says Nehemiah, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, the king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Sometime later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here, I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw all Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms, and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together, and I stationed them at their posts. The word of the Lord. Pray with me. Give me Jesus. Lord, give me Jesus. They can have all of the rest. Just give me Jesus. So there it was, a squatter, a guy just living at the temple, this new beautiful temple that Zerubbabel had built and Ezra had blessed and Nehemiah had continued, a guy just living at the church. It makes Nehemiah so mad, 
he throws the guy's things out the window. I kind of think it would be like a, a wife who was cheated on, just throwing her husband's things on the yard. <laughs> I like the fact she had written the word cheater on the truck if she was going to give it away for free. To the best of my knowledge, uh, we do not have anybody living permanently at the church. Sometimes we have people who come and, and need a place to stay, you know, temporarily. We don't kick them out of the breezeway or anything. Uh, we try to help them if we can. But Nehemiah said he was greatly displeased and he threw all of the things out of the room. Now, we do have tenants at the church. We have the Thrive Academy that meets down in the FLC. We have the Montessori Preschool and School for kids on the autism spectrum. We have the Boy Scouts who meet here and the Girl Scouts now. But to the best of my knowledge, we do not have anybody living at the church on a full-time basis. I mean, I have a very comfy chair. Sometimes I think in my office I could sleep at overnight if I had to. <laughs> Elizabeth has not kicked me out of the house yet, so we're okay. We have two kitchens, a couple of nice showers down in the FLC, plenty of furniture, but nobody living at the church. Well, actually, I think sometimes Danny lives here. <laughs> Nehemiah worked too hard. His ministry was too blessed to have this happen to his beloved city and church. Remember, Nehemiah uh, happened uh, to come to Jerusalem because this is the place where his ancestors were laid to rest. He had a special feeling. And who was this guy, Tobiah, anyway? The guy who was just hanging out at the temple, having a little side business out of one of the rooms. Living in the rooms meant for the things of God. Well, way back in the second chapter of Nehemiah, we found out this Tobiah guy was against the rebuilding of the temple and Jerusalem in the first place. He was an Ammonite, for Pete's sake. He wasn't even supposed to be in the temple. So why did we go through all the work, all the bother of rebuilding Jerusalem if it's just going to be used that way? Nehemiah must have asked himself that over and over again. And for that matter, why even build anything at all? In a radio sermon on July the 4th, 1946, J.B. Baker said that building is the noblest occupation that people can endeavor. Whether it is the building of a cabin in the wilderness, a mansion in a city, a railroad across a river, or a canal across an isthmus, builders are dreamers. And dreamers have lifted our entire world from the null and void to form and order. So let's review. Nehemiah was a dreamer, as well as being a patriot. He was a Jew born in exile who was grieved because his city, his father's father's city, lay in ruins. So his king gave him permission to go and restore it. He even made him the governor. He went out one night, surveyed the ruins, then calling these poor Jews together who still clung to the, the old ruins, he said, come let us rebuild the walls. People, as though aroused from sleep, said, yeah, yes, let's do that. Let's rebuild the walls. And so with rekindled hearts, renewed hope and faith, they began. I can think of somebody else who talked about rebuilding something. Jesus Christ said he would rebuild his body, the temple that was his body, in three days. There is a textbook I, I read, I had to read in seminary, although I actually enjoyed it, called The Death and Resurrection of the State of Israel. And in it, author Donald E. Gowan suggests that what happened to Israel in the distant past was a foreshadowing of Jesus' own death and resurrection. Now, Baker, that radio commentator, said that if Nehemiah had not rebuilt Jerusalem, in the long run, it really wouldn't have mattered. Somebody would have come along and rebuilt it. It was at too strategic of a location to let it lay in ruins. But if Jesus Christ had not rebuilt his body 
in three days. Think of the different world that would have been. No Christian churches anywhere. For the Christian church is built upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, that was the greatest boast of the early church, was that everybody knew. It was common knowledge that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Matthew, who wrote his gospel some years after the resurrection, said the truth of the resurrection is commonly reported even among the Jews until his present day. And Matthew's time was a matter of common knowledge, and nobody really questioned it. That's why, as the eyewitnesses to the resurrection, to Jesus coming to life again, began to die, some martyred, but mostly just through old age. That's when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John began to write down these words, these eyewitness testimonies to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Baker would be so bold to say, and remember, he was broadcasting on the 1st July 4th after the Second World War, that we have no more right to question the resurrection now than we ever did before, or more than any other historical event like the Declaration of Independence. That only happened once in all of history. And it was common knowledge, so we accept it today. We had 50 states because of it. And as a result of that document, you see, so the churches exist because of the resurrection, the rebuilding of the temple, of the body of Jesus Christ. Now, if somebody had not rebuilt those walls it would not remain an important city. That's true. And for some reason, God chose Jerusalem where Jesus would die and be resurrected and complete the work of salvation. It was all done. It was complete through the acts of Jesus Christ. Now, that is the big difference between what we are doing today and the rebuilding of the temple and what happened to and for and with Jesus Christ. Our job is continuing. Romans chapter 8 tells us that the, God, the work of God has been done, completed. We have to accept it. But nothing we can do will further our own salvation. It's all up to Jesus. It's all up to God. But in the temple and in Jerusalem, there was still more to do. It must have killed Nehemiah to see what his temple had come to, what it was like. There were people living at the church. See, the people, as it turns out, weren't even paying the priests or the Levites or the musicians. They were trying to keep the temple going, like what the Book of Moses said they should. It's hard to keep a good thing going. Now, okay, say Ben Affleck, okay? He's had a remarkable string of hits at the beginning of his career. And today, he's recognized as one of the most successful actors and filmmakers in the world. But people forget that he had a dramatic downturn in his career in the early 2000s. Some people found his, his brash and almost bullying style to be a real turnoff. Now, after Goodwill Hunting, where he won the Oscar, and he and Matt Damon, um, he, he made a movie that he said was the worst mistake, the only movie he ever made it that he regretted, Daredevil. It was a bad movie. I saw it. <laughs> then to pick up his spirits, he made a movie with his girlfriend, Jennifer Lopez, called Genie. It was one of the most unsuccessful movies in history, and it almost killed his career. In fact, he said, I thought I was finished. Then he discovered directing. And his film, Argo, his first directorial debut, had won the Academy Award for Best Picture. And even though he was snubbed, you know, for the winner of the Best Picture, you usually choose that director as the best director, but he wasn't even nominated for it. Although critics later on said he probably deserved it. So Elizabeth and I last week watched Argo, and I tell you, it is a fantastic movie. It's a movie of hope in a very rough time for the United States. And it's since then, it seems like he's turned everything around. He's Batman, for crying out loud. Perhaps admitting 
to himself and to others that he was an alcoholic in 2017 helped him to turn his life around. Um, it's a big part of his recovery. But he also seems to have found God, and we can't really hold it against him that he is a Methodist. <laughs> said that the 12-step program helped him make his faith the foundation of his recovery. Remember, there are no recovered addicts. Only recovery. It's a process. They even say that he and Jennifer Lopez are back together again. Here we go, another trip down, down Benifer Lane. <laughs> I guess the romantic lives of celebrities is sort of a weird process. But maintaining the purity of the temple would prove to be an ongoing process, just like it is in our lives. We take wrong turns. We go down dead ends. We don't often appear to know we're off course until it seems too late. And we think we're finished. But fortunately, in the building of our lives, in our worship to God Almighty, we have a powerful tool. It's called praise. And you saw some of it today. The Headway Clinic lists four benefits of using positive praise and affirmations as reducing negative thoughts, increased happiness, keeping the small things in perspective, and even better cardiovascular health. Makes you think twice about what we're doing when we're praising. When I was uh, going through my sermon this morning doing a couple of rewrites, as I actually usually do on, on Sundays, uh, Elizabeth was out walking Maddie, our dog, our current dog. And I, it would be great if we could somehow train Maddie uh, to bring my newspaper to me, but he doesn't, he, she doesn't do it. In fact, it's usually Elizabeth who has to bring my newspaper, and she did that this morning. But when we were walking our previous dog, Viola, we were going by the house of a pastor of a neighboring church. And as we were going by, we noticed that there was this little puppy coming out. And the puppy grabbed the newspaper in her teeth and walked it back up to the pastor who was in the doorway of their house. And I said, how did you do that? She said, yeah, well, we can't blame her for being Methodist. <laughs> How did you do that? And they said, you just have to train her. You have to give her praise. You have to give her treats. Training takes a lot of not only negative stimulus. I can't tell you. Elizabeth is a dog trainer in our family. And I can't tell you how many times she has to say, no, no. But it's also, yes, good dog, good dog. Well, Viola died when she was 13. That's, um, what, 91 in dog years. And maybe you really cannot teach an old dog new tricks, but there's still hope for Maddie. She's a, a teenager in dog years. A woman named Marion Gilbert opened her front door one day, and to her surprise, she was going to go out and get the paper, but to her surprise, here's this little dog that she doesn't know, who has the paper in, her, in the dog's teeth. Wow, she said, way to go. It wasn't her dog, it was just some random dog. Good dog, you know, and she said, I could get used to this, this is great service. And she lavished praise on the dog, and, and she gave her treats. Now remember, not her dog, just some random neighborhood dog, she suspects, and, and she really doesn't think very much of it until the next morning when she goes to her door to go out and get her newspaper, and there again is the dog with the newspaper in the dog's teeth and also eight additional newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> she said she had to spend the rest of the day going around to her neighbors trying to figure out who didn't have their paper and somehow explain to them why she had it. Praise can be powerful, but we have to be careful what we pray. How powerful is praise in your life? When you praise others, you lift them up. But the difference is that when we praise God, we are lifted up. That's what happens when we praise God in worship. Remember, all the way back to Ezra 3 that we read six weeks ago, with praising and thanksgiving they sang to the Lord. He is good. 
His love towards Israel endures forever, and all the people have a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. They were not only building up the house of the Lord, they were being lifted up. And I think that's how it got done so fast. And that's what we should take away ourselves. Throughout Ezra and Nehemiah, we have seen it again and again. The people of God get permission to build something, a temple, a wall, and then they run into opposition. But then they lift up their prayers to God and praise and thanksgiving, and they complete their task. God helps them complete their task. If you have a really great Sunday morning here at church, does it, does it carry through for you for the rest of your week? It does for me. It does for me, and I hope it does for you. It keeps me going. You see, Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah faced opposition. They all lifted up praise and thanksgiving, and then God helped them build their dreams. And they set the stage for Jesus Christ himself to come along among them. That's a, that's a pretty good reason to build. We've been building this edifice, pillar, column, monolith. Oh, I like that. I like that. And just one brick, one stone at a time. Did you notice it the first week it was here? Some of you did. Some of you said, what the heck is that? <laughs> just up here. Huh? <laughs> Thanks to Stephen and Cindy Shader, by the way, you were the ones who were building it the whole time. You might have noticed some construction cones around it at one point. Wait until you see what happens to these stones on Easter. You may have to go down to the FLC, but there's going to be another building that happens because of that. What do you think we'll build with him? What do you think you will build by then? That's only going to be eight weeks from now. What will you build in your life by the time of Easter? Are you including thanksgiving and praise when you do it? Those are powerful building blocks. Now, when you're, when you're finished, what will your building look like? Will you, will you take just a little time every day to just build one thing, one block that, that rests upon the other? I hope you take that time. I hope that you do it every day, because after that day is done, it's gone. You can't get it back. But, you know, it's not too late to start building today, because you're not finished. Pastor Jason King from the Bayside Baptist Church in Harrison, Tennessee, asks this question, how old was Abraham when God used him to start a new nation, a new epoch of human experience? He was a hundred. Yeah. How old was Moses when God told him to go free his people? Uh, he was eighty. Those are not God's years. <laughs> They're people years. And these people just stayed faithful to God. They weren't perfect. They were just yielded to God's grace, His will, ready to build for Him. So don't give up. No matter how old you are or feel, <laughs> when you're building your life upon the foundation that God has laid, it will bear fruit. No matter how old you get. Giving thanks and praise to God will still benefit you. God does not have a retirement plan for giving thanks. You can retire from a job. You can finish school. But there is no retirement plan in God's economy. When you die, you will be with God. But until then, God still has plans for you right here. Even for old guys like Moses and Abraham. Even for young guys like Zerubbabel and Nehemiah. Even for people like you and me. When Jesus says he is the vine and we are the branches, he reminds us that apart from God, we can do nothing. But if we can continue to live in God, to give him thanks and praise, we will prosper. Remain in me as I remain in you. 
No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Remain in me, says God. Live with God inside of you. Abide with God. I will do the rest, he says. Don't give up. We are not finished. Pray with me, please. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, thank you for Thank you for the knowledge of how to build. Thank you for your grace in showing us the way to build. Help us to build together something that gives you glory and praise. So be Deo Gloria to God alone. Be the glory. Amen. Would the ushers please come forward to collect these <coughs>
That is the address of First Presbyterian Church. But you know there are 168 hours in a week? That means for the 167 other hours of the week, unless you're like Cindy, who spends about 15 hours a week here, or, <laughs> or Stacy, who does the same, or Karen, or any of these guys, for the other 167 hours, the an address of this church is your address. It's your home, it's your store, it's the, the gym you go to, or your clubhouse in your community. That is where this church goes, the other 167 hours. So uh, let me urge you, take the name of the Lord with you. When we build something here, take it with you to go where you live. And do so knowing that you are blessed by the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, one God, now and forever. Amen.